Welcome to all of you, and especially all of you joining from uh, us from all over the world. Um, please remember, um, for those joining virtually, to submit your, your questions to, to the broadcast. Um, before I, I um, invite Liz Alderman, uh, our European business correspondent, to come up on stage with the panel, I'd just like to run a very short video and um, express my sincere gratitude to, to Morgan Stanley for sponsoring this event. Thank you. I'm Audrey Choi, Chief Sustainability Officer at Morgan Stanley and CEO of the Institute for Sustainable Investing. Welcome to the New York Times Climate Hub taking place alongside COP26. The health of our planet is now the existential issue for business leaders and government leaders alike. The important conversations happening here in Glasgow are a critical catalyst for the actions we need to take to stem the long-term effects of climate change. Clearly, the time for action is now. To begin, I'd like to share with you some of our best thinking on one of the topics we're here to discuss. Thank you, and enjoy the session. Green Bonds give investors an opportunity not just to get a good return, but also to do good with their money as well. Green Bonds are like any other traditional bond, but they come with a commitment from the company to invest in specific projects that achieve an environmental or social outcome. When the green bond market first started back in 2007, 2008, there were small retail targeted transactions. Now, it's over $200 billion a year in issuance. We've seen a full spectrum of projects being supported by green and sustainability bond transactions. Everything from more energy efficient ice cream cabinets to better forestry and farming through to developing affordable and social housing. The bond market is a natural home for sustainability. Buying green bonds is, is, is not just doing good, it's good business. I'm Navinda Katagampala, and we are Morgan Stanley. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at the New York Times Climate Hub, those of you who are joining in person, and a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us, the many people who are joining us online for this panel, um, which is about the next big thing in green finance, valuing biodiversity. I'm Liz Alderman. I'm the Chief European Business Correspondent for the New York Times, and uh, I mean, this is probably one of the most timely panels that we're going to have at this conference, given the many announcements that we've heard in the last couple of days. Um, we have heard world leaders step up with hard commitments to reverse global warming, countries vow to stop deforestation and curb coal, and to pay for it all, titans of finance, led by Mark Carney, who have pledged trillions in assets toward hitting net zero emissions targets in their investments. Now, these pledges come with a great deal of responsibility, not only to meet them, but to ensure that investments don't actually harm the environment while claiming to protect it. And that's what we're gonna be talking about and focusing on today, because 
Uh, when we talk about the next big thing in green finance, we must talk about biodiversity and all of this, because many investments that do address climate change can actually impact nature and biodiversity in ways that harm more than help, especially in the global south. So, you know, how do governments and companies gauge all of that? I'm really thrilled to have a very distinguished panel here today to discuss that. Um, we've got Mark Carney uh, joining us uh, virtually. Uh, the, you are the, uh, obviously the UN Special Envoy on, on Climate Action uh, and Finance. Um, Mindy Lubber is joining us virtually as well. You are the CEO of the sustainability nonprofit Ceres. Here on stage, we've got Andy Purvis. You're the research leader uh, at the Natural History Museum uh, in London. And uh, we've got M. Sanjayan, very thrilled to he have you here, uh, the chief executive of Con Conservation uh, International, and very happy to have us uh, have you joining us uh, virtually, Elizabeth Maruma Rema, who's the executive secretary of the Secretariat of the United Nations Convention on Bio Biological Diversity. Now, let me start, if I could, with since we're talking about money here. Uh, let me start, if I could, with you, Mark. Um, you're the money man. You presided over this very major uh, announcement yesterday. Huge sums pledged toward hitting net zero investment targets, promises to hold investors accountable. It, take a step back for just a moment and explain to us why is that a watershed moment? We can't, can you, uh, you might be muted. Up, oh, you're still muted, <laughs> and we'd love to hear what you're saying. <laughs> all right, well, actually, um, for the tech folks, we're having trouble hearing uh, all of our people who are joining online. So actually, while we're getting that fixed, uh, M. Sanjan, let me, let me actually turn to you <laughs> and ask, ask you to answer that question, then I want to hear what Mark has to say. <laughs> but, I, I have no business yeah. <laughs> doing that. Um, well. All right, well, let me just uh, try and frame it this way. Yeah. We are, business as usual is clearly not working. Uh, everywhere you go, look out of your window, anywhere you travel, your backyards, the places you love, they're threatened, they're endangered. So clearly, Business as usual is not working. 40 times more funding, at least, has poured into activities that destroy nature than the fraction, it's not even a rounding error, frankly, that has gone into protecting it. There is nothing on the planet that we in conservation or the museum scientists can do to turn that around if we do not realign the financial flows that are out there. You can be skeptical. You should be skeptical. Promises have often been made at COPS. It's, uh, as um, David Blood said yesterday, which is a brilliant comment, it's not the road to Glasgow, it's the road from Glasgow. We can't kick the can again down the road. You should be skeptical. You should hold people accountable. But here are three things. One, at least the flows are happening. That financial flow is shifting. Where it has been is not good. The fact that it's moving is a good thing. Two, it's our jobs to make sure it goes into ways that gets it right, that does high quality projects that are pro people, pro indigenous peoples, pro local communities, that are high in biodiversity, high in carbon, uh, and away from things um, that are ultimately destructive. Uh, do you want to? Shall I give a couple of quick examples? <laughs> if you could give a couple of quick sure. examples. Sure. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples to make a little bit of that gigantic number, you know, real for some of us. Because it's very hard to get our heads around. I've just started saying the word trillion. And now we're taking, we're talking, talking about, about many trillions, 130 right? trillion and then some. So, so let me give you two little examples. One little one and one big one. Little one. Today in The Guardian is an article, admittedly about conservation international, but most importantly about blue carbon and a blue carbon project in Colombia. 
This was a project where it's the first verified blue carbon project in the world. We helped do the science, we helped do the monitoring, but the choice to do that project and who to do it with was the communities. They went with a particular buyer named in this article as Apple. That was their choice to make. And we support them in making that choice. Because of that funding flow, now mangroves are getting protected and restored in the Cispata region of Colombia. And Colombia wants to massively expand it. That's a small example of getting it right. It has to be high quality. The money must go to communities. It must actually do what it's supposed to do, protect carbon and protect biodiversity. Now, on a slightly larger scale, yesterday, day before yesterday, was a very interesting announcement from 30 financial institutions, uh, which we helped support, that basically are mobilizing about $8.5 trillion to move out of deforestation in the commodity sector and towards more positive activities. There's a roadmap. There are steps they need to take. Transparency is a big part of it. But if these financial... Um, investment firms that have signed up for it, Generation Investment, Schroders, uh, are two examples of, of folks who are there. If they agree to do it, and they have, we are starting to now see that funding move out of destructive activities and then moving into places that can ultimately protect nature. So here's two examples of which, in small scale and big scale, where I think we're trying to get it right. But it's fair to say you know, the proof is going to be in the coming months in the road from Glasgow. So it is possible to get it right is what you're saying. Hey, tell me one sector, tell me one thing that you know of that we have got it right from the beginning. I mean, planes still crash, you know, uh, my cell phone one, we can't even get this tech to work, right? <laughs> Think about the amount of money that's gone into this technology that's actually connecting all of us. Can't even get it to work. So to hold, all of a sudden, conservation to a standard that we're not holding anything else to mm. is crazy. Yeah. Doesn't mean we have to hold them, not hold us to high standards, but we have to understand this is a nascent field. There will be steps that we'll get it wrong. We need to be transparent. We need to call out bad actors. But we have to uh, take our hats off to the fact that this is finally moving. Right. Mm. Speaking of getting it right, Mark, do we have you online yet? Not yet. All right. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll come back to you when we, when, we get, when we get that right. Let me, if I could, then, uh, while, we're, while we're waiting for that, Mindy, um, you, as the president of, uh, uh, and CEO of the sustainability nonprofit, Saris, uh, it, you're, it's a very influential organization uh, that, under your leadership, has per persuaded numerous big investors, uh, boards, and executives to take sustainability risks and opportunities into account. Just let me ask you to step back for just a moment. Why does the financial sector matter for biodiversity? And why does preserving biodiversity need to be really at the core of investor strategies going forward? We can't, hold on one second while we, while we get, this, get your sound up here as well. You're muted? Okay. If anybody has, if anybody can hit the unmute button. No. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth? All right, you're, mu you're muted as well. All right, uh, yeah, can, can I just ask you quickly, are your, yeah. are your own mute buttons on your computers unmuted? All right, so it's an issue, <laughs> it's an issue mm -hmm. on our end. We're working on it. Let me, turn, <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me turn to the other person that we have live on the stage, Andy. Um, this is actually, believe it or not, a, a good moment for me to turn to you because uh, as as we're focusing on investments uh, that sustain mm. biodiversity, let me just ask you to take a step back with a sort of a simple, you know, journalistic question. First of all, just take a step back. What is biodiversity exactly? Mm -hmm. And how, how is it that certain investments that are aimed at getting us to carbon neutral, how do how does certain types of investments actually harm biodiversity? Can you give us an example of that? Yeah, sure. So a, a really good question. Biodiversity in a lot of people's minds is beautiful stuff far away, and we tend, often in public discourse, to view it as a, as a luxury. Mm -hmm. That's completely wrong, because it's actually the foundation on which our society has been built. Um, it, 
it supplies nearly all of our basic needs. Virtually all of our supply chains begin in nature, those that don't begin in fossil fuels. Mm. So fundamental to how we live. And we have got better over the millennia in managing natural systems to provide us with a small set of things that we know we want in large quantities and mainly can sell. The trouble is that in doing that, although that has been hugely beneficial to humanity, we've exceeded, in many cases, nature's ability to provide that good sustainably. It is getting weaker in a lot of the world's agricultural land, for instance. We're seeing soil erosion, loss of fertility, increase in pests, fall away in pollination. Mm -hmm. Things that nature does for free and which we're now having to pay to do. Mm -hmm. And so the loss in nature's ability to meet our needs just because of land use change is reckoned to be between four and $20 trillion a year. That's just land use impacts on mm -hmm. ecosystem services as they're called. The benefits it's like you a get fifth of nature. the money that was pledged yesterday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. every year. Yeah. Mm. And what nature provides, its, co its contribution to those ecosystem services is probably about twice the size of the money economy each mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. yeah, around $150 trillion um, dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So it is actually our economy. Mm -hmm. um, so how is it that we have a financial system that hasn't considered biodiversity risk? It's because we viewed it as an infinitely renewable resource mm -hmm. that we can't damage. And we've seen that, that really isn't true. Uh, demands on it have been growing exponentially. Uh, populations doubled, uh, po human populations mm -hmm. doubled in my lifetime. Those people are each consuming half as much again as they did 50 years ago as well. Uh, global trade has increased tenfold mm -hmm. over the same period. And so we're doing a lot of damage at a distance, which we don't even see in our day-to-day -day consumption. And a lot of that damage at a distance is, is happening particularly in, in the global south. You were yeah, so giving you, you, some examples. You wanted, yeah, so yeah. an example of, of a, of a so-called, when the term is misapplied, nature-based solution, um, bio-diesel, uh, Mm -hmm. as a carbon neutral fuel, but not if it results in the loss of tropical rainforest to grow oil palm. And so Indonesia announced last year plans to, to have 15 million hectares of oil palm for biodiesel as part of its greening strategy. Indonesia is home to <laughs> thousands and thousands of species found nowhere else. Uh, we already have a million animal and plant species threatened with extinction on this mm -hmm. planet because of our actions. Mm -hmm. um, this would condemn a large number to final extinction. But also, those palm oil forests won't provide anything other than palm oil. You know, they're biodiversity deserts and they won't provide other ecosystem services to people which a natural forest would do. So it's, it's a real lose compared with consuming less. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, on that, on that score, let me go back to our virtual guests here and ask you if you all are online yet. <laughs> Mark, let's, let's say something to see if we can hear you. Ah, la, la, as the French mm. would say. <laughs> Mindy, can we? Well, unfortunately, we can't hear you either. So I presume that, I presume that our, our tech folks are, are working furiously on this. And so, and Sanjan, let me put, let me put the spotlight back, back, on, back on you, if I may. I mean, give us a bit more uh, of, of a sense from your end of, you know, what can, what can the measures of success you know, be because, for example, in the in the announcements that are coming from the world of finance, I mean, clearly, finance this is a mainstream issue, um, not only for financial companies but for uh, corporations and obviously for governments at this point. And you know, ha what what is it that, uh, however, that 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 the financial world and that businesses do you think need from regulators um, in order to make sure 
um, that we get this right in order to make sure that sure. really the tidal wave of money that is being pledged um, toward getting to, to, to net zero emissions um, doesn't wind up doing, that those types of investments do not wind up doing more harm than good. Absolutely. So let me just speak to nature-based solutions because that's the su stuff I really understand and know a lot more about than you know, funding that goes into sort of um, renewables or green tech, uh, which are huge and massive and are growing and are on their own sort of pipeline. It's sort of a bullet train already because you can make money on it. On the NBS side, it's extraordinarily important that governments establish guardrails. Mm -hmm. Thus far, they haven't really done that that effectively. Now, that's changing. There's conversations in the UK government in, and in the US and others to establish guardrails around this new emergent market or opportunity. What I see as the greatest wealth flow from the G7 or the G20 to countries like Liberia or or Costa Rica, or Colombia, or Timor-Leste, which desperately need it, which are on the front lines of biodiversity and conservation, mm. we do need those guardrails. In the absence of that, what has happened is that nonprofits have had to shoulder the, a lot of that and try to establish our own standards, and we have our own standards, which I think are extraordinarily high, um, or industry has come up with it. And to be honest, there are some projects, like you mentioned, mm. that are clearly not good. They're clearly not done in the right spirit. So governments have to establish guardrails. You're starting to see that now. But let me also offer a word of caution. If Western governments, and this is something the global south is really sensitive to, if Western governments establish principles, or principles are OK, um, rules that, are, that countries that need this funding are unable to meet or unwilling to meet, I think that's going to be a major problem. So some of the things that we're hearing now are extraordinarily high standards, but the genuine truth is that those countries on the front lines of conservation just do not have the capacity to meet it. Mm -hmm. So we have to start by listening to the global south where most biodiversity is and where most carbon actually is as well, irrecoverable carbon. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure that we start with the perspective that local communities, indigenous peoples must be the beneficiaries. They cannot, um, they have to be brought in at the beginning, at the forefront, and then build those guardrails that way. Now, the good news is it's moving in, in, that, in that direction, and that's what I would say. Uh, let me add one other thing with N NBS. Um, which I think is um, nature-based solutions, which I think is an extraordinarily good fortune for all of us, but particularly for scientists like us. So when you look at the world's irrecoverable carbon, so you know the world is covered in carbon in terms of living things and carbon that's stored in the soil and in that topsoil. Um, uh, and there's some places that are extraordinarily rich in carbon. When you map that out, and we've done that and the papers are being published right now, you find something extraordinary. A tiny sliver of the planet has an enormous amount of irrecoverable carbon. In fact, about 3.5% of the planet has about 50% of the irrecoverable carbon. If you go a little further, 14% of the planet, just 14% of the terrestrial area of the planet, has 75% of the irrecoverable carbon and 91% of vertebrate biodiversity. That's the good news. It means we actually have a fighting chance in our lifetime capturing maximum biodiversity and maximum amount of recoverable carbon. If we lose those, there is no way under any math scenario, no matter what else we do, we can get to the Paris targets or we can actually protect the fundamentals of life that provide us jobs, food, clean air, water, medicine, keeps pandemics at bay. And that's what Mark Carney, his task force, and Mindy mm -hmm. and Elizabeth have been working so hard on. This is a tricky place, it's difficult to do, but I think we're moving in the right direction, and it's our jobs to help them and hold all of us accountable to move in the right direction. Absolutely, and I would love to hear from the three of you. So, <laughs> Mark, oh. give, it a, give it one more test. Let's Shout. see if we can hear you. Mm. Ooh. No. We can, I, I hear a tiny, a tiny voice coming from somewhere, but not quite enough to hear you. Uh, I'm sorry? Okay, mm. we're, we're still waiting. Well, can I, I'm sorry, we can, we can hear his, their voices slightly, so maybe if you could turn up the maybe volume. Ah, yes. bravo, welcome. <laughs> Great. 
All right. Well, Mark, you know, um, thanks for being patient. We, we can lay down. You know, let me just actually at this point ask you to, to jump in here, respond uh, to some of the stuff that, that Sanjan and, you know, and Andy have been talking about, but in particular, take a step back and, and if I could ask you, you know, to maybe start talking about what the same question that I just asked Sanjan, what is the measure of success here? for this initiative that you sort of presided over yesterday, because even as you were talking about this, I mean, we, we did hear, you know, voices sharply questioning the quality and integrity of those pledges. Uh, Greta Thunberg, you know, tweeted uh, from the same room a greenwash alert. So, you know, how do, how, what is your pro proposal yeah. for basically keeping all this on the right track? Well, I think the first, First thing, it's a great pleasure to be on this, uh, finally, and I really enjoyed the conversation thus far, so I've learned a lot already, um, and I'm going to learn a lot from my fellow panelists, so I'll try and be quick. Um, I think, you know, the, the commitments are very high integrity, to be clear, the commitments are, um, and they're building on the work of Ceres and Climate Action 100 and the PAII and uh, Net Zero Asset Managers and other core initiatives. Um, and, and to be clear, what the institutions are committing to, obviously net zero by 2050 at the latest, for their financed emissions, so their lending and their investments of their clients, the emissions of their clients as well as their own, but their fair share of the 50% down in emissions we need by 2030 to be on track to one and a half, and five-year decarbonization plans they have to put out within the next 12 to 18 months, and annual reporting against the highest standard, which is PCAP standards, and using the low, no overshoot, one and a half degree scenarios of the IEA, IPCC. So there is, and 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 this is this. There's you know an external uh, um, advisory body on this, um, as well as uh, the links in the UNFFI. So I candidly, I, it's good to have scrutiny, uh, but it's good to have scrutiny that's also actually gone into the details and read exactly what the commitments are. And I think the commitments, you know, uh, from, from where we look at it, from where UNFFI looks at it, where Race to Zero, which is part of the UNF, Triple C's core commitments to get to one and a half degrees and drives all this. Uh, when we look at it, it is exactly what uh, Sanjan said, David Blood said, which it's scrutiny on the road from Glasgow. How are these commitments followed through? And I think what's crucial about this panel, I'll make two other quick comments just to keep it focused. Well, you, you, you do a good job of focusing it, Liz, so I, I'll try and drive it. But first on what Andy said about evaluation of ecosystem services and just this disconnect between what we value in the market and what we don't. One of the core questions, by the way, is how much do we want to bring in the market and how much do we just want to count on nature's own terms? Because you can, mm -hmm. you can make mistakes by pricing too much. That's a big topic. And then the second thing, which I think is the heart of what you're saying, I really commend you and the New York Times for putting this issue at the forefront, uh, which is how do we ensure that while we're on the road to net zero, and let's hope we are properly on the road to net zero, one and a half degrees, that we don't do other harms to, uh, to biodiversity, to indigenous peoples as we go. And that has to be at the forefront. And if I may, just, um, you know, uh, some of the great work that uh, Mindy and Sirius have done on uh, the role of natural climate solutions in corporate commitments. Uh, you know, actually looking at these commitments and, and how do we use these nature-based solutions. My very last point, just uh, as it's been raised, is there is a prospect of having a market um, for nature-based solutions, um, carbon credits, um, that can contribute to rebuilding of biodiversity. It's not its mm -hmm. core Goal. It certainly can never do any harm. It has to support indigenous peoples. All of these are fundamental building blocks, but actually can be contributory uh, in potentially quite a significant way. And very, I, I would say it's my last point. This really is my last point to pick up on what Sanchez was saying again, is that uh, if the projects are integrated from the start with the local communities, it's far, far more likely that all of those conditions are going to be met. But of course, we need external scrutiny. But I would, I would really underscore as a high-level point: bring the scrutiny with the, against the actions. These commitments yeah. are very, very strong. They are very, very tough. And so the question is whether there's going to be follow-through. Right. Bring the scrutiny against the actions. And Mindy, I see you, you know, nodding your head. Hopefully, we can hear your voice as well at this point. <laughs> what is? <laughs> we can hear you. Great. I mean, how do you how do you respond? But basically, what is what is your what is your reaction to, to all of this? And you know, how easy 
is what Mark was just talking about going to, going to be to carry out? Well, let me answer the first, the last part. It's not easy, and nor did Mark suggest it was going to be easy. On the other hand, it's essential, it's an imperative. Mm -hmm. Just to put this in context, somehow we've had a debate around climate change over here and around biodiversity in some other space. These are one set of issues. If COVID taught us anything, is we live in an interlocking world. Um, so we've got to apply these together. We cannot meet our climate goals, period, end of story, nor could we sustain a viable economy if we ignore biodiversity. Our economy is built off of the materials that we mine, the planet that we have, uh, and we've got to look at it in an integrated way. Secondly, biodiversity, if we don't act sooner rather than later, we're continuing to see it um, be more and more damaged as we hear, and that's no longer an option. So I think one point for the, or a few points for this discussion. One is to recognize and change the narrative completely. These are one set of issues. Number two, we need to define it in a way, we need to address biodiversity first and foremost as something that we do in a humane way that is about the people who live in communities, not just those of us who are worried about the global economy. I mean, these are one thing. If we don't create standards that incorporate the needs of people on the front lines who live in the communities, but only deal with the economic importance of biodiversity, uh, we lose. We need to create a set of standards. My key point though is we don't have a lot of time. And so we need to define what good Bio, what biodiversity looks like, what good offsets are, what good projects are, and what projects are not good. I want to say right now, literally this day, this week, this month, large corporations and investors, and we speak to hundreds of them, are focused on addressing climate, are focused on getting to that net zero, hopefully by 2040, but certainly they've committed to 2050. We can't get there unless we address biodiversity as part of that debate. So we've got to tie these things together. The amount of attention on getting to net zero is extraordinary. That's been a lot of work for a lot of people, um, but we've ch the debate has changed. So let's be very clear how biodiversity fits into getting to those stand net zero. And I want to go further in saying the interest right now is there on the part of companies and investors. They want to know what's a good offset, what's not, what's a real nature-based solution and what's not. And we are on the verge of a lot of money going into solutions. As we heard, some of those could be increased, incredibly additive and some of them may not be. So wasting time or wasting money is no longer an option. So my general sense for our discussion is to recognize we've come an extraordinarily long way in raising the issues of needing to get to net zero in companies and investors wanting to get there and to do it right and not to make mistakes. We are being asked by hundreds of companies and investors, how do I get there? What's a good offset? What's not? What's additive? What's not? Our job collectively and globally is to come up with standards that show what's legitimate and what's not and come up with incentives to help make those things. So as much as we need to define things, as much as we need to live off the extraordinary scientists of the two people in the room with you, we need to define what's right and what's wrong and we need to put it in a mandatory regulatory framework and provide incentives and financial opportunities to get it right and to not get it wrong and to not waste time. If we do this one by one, this is a good project, that's a bad project, I'm not sure who the judge and jury is of those projects, rather than define the most legitimate and highest standards for biodiversity to get us where we need to go. But if there's not a global standard and we could have global voluntary standards, um, we need to define that and we need to put regulations in place to mandate it. We need good disclosure around biodiversity. Nobody knows what's good, what's not. Nobody's writing it down. We need the right data. We need the right systems, we need the right definitions, and it ought to be, I would argue, given pace and scale of where we're going, it ought to be mandatory. So ma mandatory requirements and transparency, transparency, transparency. Elizabeth, let me, let me turn to you. We're thrilled to be able to hear your voice at last. Um, 
Uh, before, before, I ask, uh, before I ask this next question of you, uh, speaking of questions, uh, just a reminder to our audience as well as to our online audience that we will be taking questions the last 10 minutes of this panel, so please get those ready. But Elizabeth, your reaction to basically what we've said here today, because you, uh, in your role, have said time and time again that, that biodiversity must be valued in decision making at all levels. Um, and so, you know, what is your view of, I mean, how do we get governments to send consistent and strong signals so that businesses act accordingly? Thank you very much and my pleasure to join the panel. Indeed, by the, unless biodiversity is valued, then it means we will continue to plunder it as if it is there for free for anybody to do what they want. But I think the important message here, number one, is it's still unfortunate uh, that our, gov our global governance structure uh, still tend to treat climate issues separate from biodiversity. Mm -hmm. The world in, is in Glasgow now with the mindset uh, to deal with climate change issues, ensuring uh, we get into net zero, 1.5 degrees and the like delighted that more and more in different panels as we hear, particularly, uh, was it yesterday or day before yesterday, uh, the leaders event on the deforestation and land use, we heard now biodiversity coming up at the forefront. So clearly, we need to begin to look at climate change, land degradation, biodiversity as the triple crisis is facing the world, because we cannot have solutions on climate change, and all the panelists have uh, underlined, if not uh, looking at how to deal with the loss of biodiversity, how to deal with the land issues. Reports have told us recently, the primary drivers of loss of biodiversity include climate change, land sea use, over-exploitation of resources, uh, evasive alien species, and it goes into secondary uh, drivers, infrastructural development, governance issues, increase in population. So if we look at all these issues, then climate change, biodiversity are inseparable. So when we bring that into finance, business uh, action, uh, and even looking at what uh, Saja was talking about, the nature-based solutions. In fact, a number of uh, uh, quarters in the biodiversity community are worried with regards to looking at just nature-based solution without combining it uh, or also considering ecosystem-based approaches as part of the solution for both climate change and uh, biodiversity. So I think from Glasgow, I had that message, is also looking at these connected issues because the solutions are also connected. And I'm sure mm -hmm. the financial sector, private sector, will not want to uh, end up into what one would say, too many messages, but all dealing, uh, getting us into the same goal. And right. this is where the issue of metric standards come in, the information. What is this information, the standards which then the uh, financial sector need to have at hand to be able to assess their risks, the impacts of their activities on nature, their dependencies on biodiversity and nature, and the opportunities that nature provides. You have already, yeah. It has already been underlined by the previous panelists, that nature is no longer there for free. It needs to be costed. Right. Half of the global economy is dependent on nature, so there are yeah. opportunities there. But how do we bring all these together? Well, that's, that's, that's the sort of trillion, literally trillion dollar okay. question, as it were. Andy, quickly over to you. I see you. Yeah, so, so a point that picks up on that and also something Mark said. So yeah. valuation is not a thing that everyone is going to agree on, what the value of nature is. I would argue that there's a shortcut, which is to say that it is beyond price. 
and that the mandatory, um, the rules need to mandate that you're nature positive. What you do enhances biodiversity. And then you don't have to worry about the valuation. And by enhanced biodiversity, that means improving the long-term survival chances of species and also improving the condition of local ecosystems on which local people depend. And we can do that and manage, businesses can manage their risks around that. And you know, we're developing a tool for, for mm -hmm. that kind of risk impact management. Yeah. But you don't need to have a number if you say that the number is infinity. But I we wonder, I mean, is nature. that, is, 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 what, is what you're proposing something that, uh, Mark, I'd love to hear you on this, you know, that regulators would really, I guess, uh, get into that sort of granular level of, of, of regulation because yes. what Andy and all of you have been talking about is obviously incredibly important. But for example, when you have, somebody's clearly investing in that palm oil field um, that had required a rain, part of a rainforest to be cut down and planted certainly with trees, but with monospecies trees. Um, some company and some investors are making a lot of money off of that um, as a carbon offset investment as well. So how do you, how do you sort well, of <laughs> reverse that? You do. Well, I think you do a couple of things. Uh, first off, I agree. Uh, let me make a couple quick points. One, I agree a move ultimately to mandatory standards is, is appropriate. Secondly, I'll observe uh, the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, which is a voluntary process, which could I, ideally will provide some basis for this. Um, uh, and very importantly, uh, a core principle of that and a principle that's been implicit in all our uh, comments, but I'll be clear, it's not just what, what a company takes from nature, it's obviously the company's impact on nature and all aspects of nature. Uh, sort of inside out in the in, in the language of it, um, and so the example that you just used, Liz, it's looking at both um, the economics of that, even the offset of it, but the biodiversity impact of the of the, um, and so when we speak of uh, and, and when you look at the voluntary carbon market, um, it's looked at from a perspective of potentially having co-benefits. So it starts from a do no harm, and then it's whether or not there's additionality from a biodiversity nature uh, benefits for indigenous communities and others. And the possibility, of course, that is a more attractive um, offset or carbon credit. Um, that, and I, again, I agree with Mindy that we need global voluntary rules, and there's a, a very clear process uh, that's in place in order to do that. And I, you know, I, I would really commend that uh, as being the route forward. And uh, uh, we can talk about it if we have any time. Um, last point, though, on what Andy said, again, to reinforce, uh, we should count nature on its own terms um, and make and, and, and be, uh, have these commitments to be nature positive as we go, um, because after all, the reason we're having this conversation is, uh, from a financial perspective, the climate is easy once you start counting it. Uh, because you can look at whether you're moving towards or away from net zero for a company, for a sector, for a country, for the globe, and you can have an implicit or ideally an explicit, but price on that carbon. Um, and that's easy. Uh, biodiversity is much more difficult, uh, which is why we need the integrated approach we're talking about. And, and given the crisis, uh, we need to build it now. Right. Sanj and Sanjay, and I presume that you would agree with that. Yeah, generally. <laughs> I don't, I really don't, I want to make sure they get plenty yeah. of time. I had, I had a lot of time. I, I will say one absolute truth. Nature will be more valuable tomorrow than it is today. Yeah. No matter how we, I mean, I, I agree in some ways. I, I find it infinitely valuable right now. I think it exists in its own right, whether or not we want to value it or not. But in general, it will be more valuable tomorrow than it is today. So if you have money to move, Now's the time to do it. it. You're not going to get a better deal than protecting nature uh, than you could do right now. <laughs> Great. Let me, let me ask if, there, if we have questions from the audience. We can open it up. Yes, please, if we could bring the microphone over. Please identify yourself. Hi, my name is... Does this work? Hmm. Yes. Hi, my name is Romina. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Plan A. Um, I had a very interesting discussion yesterday with someone from the Ministry of Environment of Ecuador, 
And he explained to me that there is extensive illegal logging that is happening um, in the forest because of poverty. People mm. essentially go and uh, get a tree that can value, um, be valued for more than $1,000, whereas the average salary is $400. Um, and his explanation of the response to the indigenous people fight, which is essentially battling for the rainforest for a long time, was, well, how do you justify us putting even more ranges if we cannot afford to take care of even basic needs mm. of our society? Um, I'm sure that this discussion is a long one, but the question that I have is, what is the financial mechanism for responsibility and embedding into the mindset of a society that maybe is not as educated on the importance of nature, even though they have it more than maybe many of us do. Um, and how can maybe the Western world also take responsibility for that? Because we do influence some of the decisions that maybe the governments mm -hmm. there make. That's a really great, great question. I mean, basically, as somebody put it to me recently from the ILO, people need to think about the end of the month before they can think about the end of the world. Um, mm -hmm. Who would like to, to take that question? Let me start. Let me start with uh, Elizabeth. I think uh, probably few or two simple things. One, we need the governments to put the adequate laws, regulations to protect the trees and manage to avoid uh, that illegal illegal logging. But to do the laws are in place. What normally lacks is enforcement. So how does enforcement is improve, improve? And awareness raising is part of the enforcement mechanism because the local communities need to see the advantages of them protecting their areas, the forest. Otherwise, then, yes, they will encourage and, in fact, support illegal logging if they do not see and uh, really witness the benefits from their conservation actions. So again, awareness raising, how the benefits accrue back to the communities and enforcement mechanisms to uh, have that illegal logging. Thank you. Enfor enforcement is certain, would certainly be very important. From, from an economic perspective, um, which, which was a central, one of the central parts of your question. I wonder, Mark, I mean, <laughs> how do you deal with the pure yeah. economics of this? Well, I think you, there are a couple ways uh, you, you improve the economics of it. Uh, first is the negative, um, which is what we've been discussing in terms of uh, the nature impacts of a company. So in the Ecuadorian example, you know, where does the log go? What's it used for? Is it part of a supply chain that's ultimately uh, for a company that will, in the hopefully near future, provide an accurate accounting of its impact on nature, all aspects of nature? So that's the first thing. And so this is obviously reduction of the biodiversity and the impact there. The second is a more positive way, which is can become possible, um, which is um, for avoided deforestation. Uh, this is one of the types of carbon credits that could develop. Now you need a rigorous and high integrity approach to be sure that you're actually paying for avoided deforestation, not just paying the money for uh, money for nothing, so to speak. Um, but there's ways of doing that. Um, there's ways of establishing that, and that's what this new voluntary carbon offset market uh, is looking to develop. And if I can make one more point, uh, to put it in the bigger picture, uh, it is the view of some, uh, myself included, that it's the responsibility of companies. Um, this is not this is not in lieu of um, re absolute emission reductions. They have to reduce their emissions if we're going to get to net zero. But while they're on that pathway to reducing emissions, they should be compensating the world for the emissions that they still produce. And one form of that compensation, given the nature crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the Ecuadorian example, is to pay so that that individual, in effect, that community, uh, has less of an incentive to cut down their natural heritage because they'll have a flow of, uh, a flow of money. Um, so those are two ways that you can improve the situation. I'm not saying uh, that it absolutely flips it, but um, it uh, certainly improves it. May I say yeah, one quick thing? Absolutely. So I think there is a false dichotomy, like most dichotomies, a false. Um, 
you know, I grew up in Sierra Leone in West Africa in the 70s, and I watched the rainforest get absolutely ravaged around me. As a child, I didn't really know what was happening. But I can tell you that during that time, you lost the rainforest, and I did not see anyone getting richer. Certainly no one around us, no one in the villages that we visited all the time. So this idea that you're going to cut that last bit of forest and, someone's, and, and the community is generally going to be better off is nearly always false. The, the other part, yeah. when you call for, this is why I am not always a great proponent of the idea of divestment. I can understand it useful in some places, but you're right. Someone has to feed themselves that day. Deforestation is actually hard work. Cutting something down for charcoal is backbreaking work. So it is much more useful when we take the financial flows and try and move them in a way that can give people more opportunities for making, say, money out of reforestation than cutting it down, as opposed to saying, let's just divest. That's incredibly important. And actually, I mean, you know, one of, one of the major sort of pillars of the European Union's uh, effort to basically become a, a carbon neutral continent by, by 2050 is uh, the so-called just transition, um, which basically is a blueprint that, that tries to lay out ways of uh, quickly transforming communities that would be severely impacted in terms of jobs and livelihood by things like closing down coal mines. You know, we just heard a pledge from a large number of countries yesterday that, th that they would be shutting down coal mines. Obviously, huge concern about those coal mining jobs. Uh, I was just in Greece, for example, where they've laid out a blueprint where these dirty lignite mines would be closed uh, to uh, eventually transform that area, for, uh, for example, to an area that would produce sustainable agriculture, sustainable tourism, and things like that. Those things take time. In the meantime, what they have been doing there is using extra money that the country has gotten from trading their carbon credits to subsidize uh, particularly you know, poor, poor people and making sure that citizens know that that money is coming from uh, this climate initiative. Um, but let me, uh, if we could, turn to uh, another question in the few minutes that we have remaining. Yes. Thank you, Liz. We have uh, two questions from our virtual audience. Yes. Um, how are the beneficiaries of ecosystem services and nature-based solutions determined? And how can we best protect and account for biodiversity and ecosystem services that cross the boundaries of protected areas and valuation frameworks? For example, deforestation leakage or migrating animals and insects. Mm -hmm. Andy, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So. Uh, Mark has emphasized the importance of having the right data for us to be able to track the state. Um, we've seen that in the climate space, we're getting a greater level of granularity in order to be able to track spatially and temporally where emissions come from, together with global data on who is kind of responsible for what is happening in those places that allows attribution. So. We have biodiversity models, we have ways of monitoring biodiversity that can give that sort of level of granular detail. So we're going to need the same sort of approach to ensure that we don't see leakage just offshoring the damage to somewhere with less good regulation or to outside the edges of a protected area. And, and that is a, a kind of a technology that is on the cusp of happening now. Um, so we can, we, we can do that. One of the things that's got to happen though, and it's not only in this tracking, but more generally, biodiversity modeling is how we're going to tell whether any nationally determined contributions or what have you are going to get us to the biodiversity futures that we want. Can't do it without the models. Monitoring is how we know whether we're on track actually and that needs to feed right back into the models because the models are still first generation and they need to improve rapidly. We have to close that information loop, make it work really, really fast. And it'll work at all scales. So it'll work at the scale of the actions of an individual company, of a, of a settlement, an administrative unit or whatever, all the way up so that we can actually land safely in the future. Because without that closed loop, we're kind of trying to land this plane safely into a sustainable future, and we're not even looking out the windows. We don't know what's happening on the ground. 
That's mm. no way to land safely. I'd say free prior informed consent. Indigenous peoples, local communities must be there from the ground up. It's ultimately their choice to make. It's of course government as well and others, but they have to have that say. The second thing I would say is, certainly for any project we do, but I think this should be a standard, minimum 50% of the benefits must accrue to the people who live there. Mm. Great. Well, uh, in, in the last basically 30 seconds that we have remaining, let me just ask all of you a yes or no question. I mean, are you confident that we will leave Glasgow this time with real momentum for finance as a, so a solution? to biodiversity uh, and climate change rather than an impediment? <laughs> Nobody's answering. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so let me jump in. I think what Mark Carney announced yesterday, the kind of changes we're seeing, $120 trillion in, of assets under management, of people managing that, stepping up, commitments to climate. Uh, will we get everything that's needed for tomorrow? No, but am I confident we're going to leave Glasgow with progress, uh, material financial progress, and I would say most definitely. Great. Optimistic? It's incredible progress. I mean, yeah. my God, we, we think of the alternative. We could have left here with the same thing. Yeah. And the same thing's what's got us here. So how in God's green earth can we sit here and say, this is not an extraordinary moment? And it's yeah. our job, all of our jobs, to make sure it's shaped in the right way. So hats off to Mark and others who've done this. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Sanjay. Now, I'll just reinforce what both of you said. I do think it's extraordinary progress, and Mindy's helped build it, and as of you and others. And it's to shape it now, to shape yeah. it, and, and to shape it including biodiversity and nature. Yeah. Because after all, it's the Glasgow Financial Alliance for net zero. Uh, and so that that vision and that objective has the broader uh, perspective that it, that it needs. But it is, uh, it is a watershed. Absolutely. Well, so it's an extraordinary moment. And I want to thank you all for leaving us uh, all with, on, on that optimistic note. Thank you all very much for taking the time to join us for this panel. We really appreciate it. And uh, we will wrap up, um, but once again, very much appreciate all of your participation. What you all have said here today is really significant. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.